Woo, that was awesome. Just like being in a NASCAR. Well, Marty, you gotta go a little faster to get the full NASCAR experience, to feel the downforce, the draft and the drag. But those are aerodynamic forces and these are race cars. Well, you have to keep the 3Ds in mind when you're designing an airplane or a rocket ship or a race car. Well, do we have time to race again? We sure do. This yeah. is STEM in 30. Hi, I'm Beth Wilson. And I'm Marty Kelsey. And we are coming to you live from the NASCAR Hall of Fame in Charlotte, North Carolina. We are standing on Glory Road and the track is banked at 33 degrees here, just like in Talladega. Now, Glory Road is a snapshot of NASCAR history. Here you can see cars that have been dr driven by Kyle Busch, Jimmy Johnson, and Jeff Gordon. And my personal favorite, the number three car driven by Dale Earnhardt. Now, these cars change quite a bit, so you never know what you're going to see here uh, in, on Glory Road at the NASCAR Hall of Fame. And before we begin today, we want to remind all of you who are watching online that you can submit questions live, and we may take them on the air. We also have some great students from Canada in school joining us today. They are revved up and ready to go and they have some great questions for our expert. But before we get started, let's take a quick tour of the NASCAR Hall of Fame. Boogity, boogity, boogity. Hi, I'm Kevin Sleesher, Director of Exhibits at the NASCAR Hall of Fame here in Charlotte, North Carolina. The NASCAR Hall of Fame opened its doors in the spring of 2010 as a place dedicated to preserving and celebrating the history and heritage of NASCAR. In this time, 40 legendary figures, from drivers to team owners and crew chiefs, have been inducted into the Hall of Fame, and we're proud to share their stories with fans from all over the world. Our state-of-the-art facility features exciting interactive exhibits, like a pit crew challenge where visitors compete to change a car's tire and fill the gas as fast as they can, and our racing simulators that put guests behind the wheel of a race car. Our huge high-octane theater features a curved screen, surround sound, and direct from track audio, making it a great place to watch a race. Posing for a picture in front of Glory Road is a must, along a life-size track that gradually increases from zero to 33 degrees of banking, you'll find tracks represented from across the nation and 18 iconic race cars that have shaped the sport. In the Hall of Honor, you'll find the most recent Hall of Fame class, represented through videos and one-of-a-kind artifacts that paint the pictures of their incredible racing careers. We're also proud to offer fun, educational programs that engage students in real-life exploration of STEM concepts as they apply to NASCAR. There is truly something for everyone, so whether you followed a favorite driver for decades or have never witnessed a race, we encourage you to visit us and explore all that the Hall has to offer. Now I am joined by Kurt Romberg, Chief Aerodynamicist for Roche Fenway Racing. Kurt, thank you so much for being here. It's my pleasure, Beth. Kurt, what is an aerodynamicist and why do you work for NASCAR? An aerodynamicist is an engineer. I'm schooled as an engineer and I work at Roush Fenway in an effort to make the race cars go faster. We can design the cars, we can shape the cars such that as the, when the air goes over them, it creates downforce, it pushes down on the car. And what that does is that gives the tires more grip. When tires have more grip, it allows the drivers to go around the racetrack faster. So we're trying to shape the cars such that we give the car more grip. And you use one of these, is that correct? Yes, we do. This is a wind tunnel. This is a scale model wind tunnel with a scale model car here just for display. And this is the, the test article that we have inside the wind tunnel uh, proper. In a minute here, we'll go ahead and fire this thing up just so you can see we've got some streamers taped to the side of it so you can see what the air does as it goes over the car. So let's have Chloe push down on the back and you can right, talk a little right. bit about what's going on. So Chloe, what, we're, what we look gently. to do is we, we're measuring downforce and we're trying to measure downforce at the front axle and downforce at the rear axle. So underneath each one of those axles we've got a meter 
uh, much like a bathroom scale that you'd step on at home. It measures how much force is pushing down. As Chloe pushes down on the back of the car, you can see this meter go up. If she, she had long arms, she could push down on the front of the car and you'd see this meter go up too. When, when we're tuning race cars, we want to know how much aerodynamic downforce there is pushing down on the front of the car and how much there is pushing down on the back of the car. What well, do you want to show us how the wind tunnel works? Yeah. If, uh, Graham, if you wouldn't mind firing that thing up, we're going to have Graham fire up the fan and it's going to blow air over the car. And you, Yeah, all the way to high. And you can watch these numbers change. You can see the numbers are actually going up because the air is pushing down on the car. Over on this side on rear downforce, you can see there's about a little over 0.7 pounds of downforce that the air is creating on the back of the car. And at the front here, you can see there's a little over 0.2. Chloe's going to help us because we're going to change the shape of the car a little bit in an effort to try to make more rear downforce. We're going to add a larger spoiler to the back of the car. And you can see the rear downforce that used to be about 0.7 is now up in the 1.1, almost 1.2 range. So we've increased the rear downforce, which is going to make the rear tires grip the racetrack and allow the race car to go faster. So downforce is all about going faster. Downforce is all about going faster, yes. <laughs> Recently, we got a chance to talk to Jacob Wallace, who is a K&N Series NASCAR driver, and he talked to us a little bit about how downforce affects him when he's actually on the track. So downforce affects driving conditions on different types of tracks. It depends on the size of the track mainly. So on a small track where you have very tight corners, um, your straightaways aren't as long, so you don't feel the you don't feel the the speed as you would on a bigger track but in the corners um where you're producing a lot of downforce and side force you really get pushed down into your seat when you're cornering and on a bigger track say uh going down a straightaway you don't feel that force pushing into your seat as much but what you do feel is the car it almost feels like as if it weighs less because you have more you have more air that's rushing over the car and under the car and ideally, you want your car to be pushed down as much into the track, but inevitably there's going to be air coming under the car as well, and that, and that starts to lift the car up. So downforce helps deliver speed, and speed is good, but along with downforce comes drag, and drag is a drag. I've got a friend that's going to help me chase, and he's not standing right here. He's way up at the top of Glory Road, and I saw Chase walk in today, and I was like, there is a fast dude, and he is so fast that he's going to run for us, but we decided we probably needed to slow him down a little bit, so we've attached a parachute to his back, and Nick is back there helping him with that. He's kind of like the pit crew, and so here in a second, I'm going to tell Chase to go, and he is going to run as fast as he can down here, and we're going to see what happens with that parachute. Chase, are you ready? All right, on your mark, get set, go! Here he comes, he is giving it some gas. Come on around the curve, come on, come on, come on. All right, nice job. Come on back, Chase. Now that was really good and you were really fast. How did that feel? It was tough with the parachute on. Why? Because the force of the air in the parachute was slowing me down. Okay, and you've run with a parachute before. Yes. Why do you do that? for training for training because you're a runner yes outstanding Kurt and Beth why is that so much harder to run with a parachute or why is it harder to run with a parachute well much like what Jacob said drag is drag right and you could see uh, through chase that 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 parachute was pulling him back and and the force that's pulling him back is aerodynamic drag now we we added drag to chase which is the opposite of what we want to do to the race cars the race cars have got motors that produce horsepower and that horsepower is used to overcome the aerodynamic drag. If you had 300 pounds of aerodynamic drag, then you gotta have, to overcome that, you gotta have more than 300 pounds of force going forward. And that's created by the engine. So if we can minimize the drag, then we can use the horsepower that the, that the engine creates to make the car go faster. Is that why we don't have side view mirrors and, that's, and that's, headlights and that's one of those reasons exactly if you guys look on your mom and dad's cars you see things like what best said side view mirrors right here headlights right here uh door handles in here the race cars don't have those but for one reason it's to reduce the aerodynamic drag um there's a lot of things on the cars that we take off so that 
in case of there in case of an accident then those parts don't go flying into the other cars too but in this case we're looking at aerodynamic drag and reducing it to make the car go faster now NASCAR needs to reduce drag, but NASA has to think about drag in a couple of different ways. It has to overcome drag to get off the planet, but it also uses drag to slow spacecraft down to land on another planet. Recently, we had a chance to talk to NASA scientist Rick Davis, and he talked to us a little bit about drag. So the question is, how does drag affect rockets? It's actually a, an incredibly important uh, thing to deal with. And so if you think about it, when you drive around in your car and you stick your hand out the window and you present a very flat surface, that's pushing your hand back. And that's actually the force of drag that's doing that. And so with rockets, we spend a lot of time, if you will look at this, this is very sleek and centrical. And if you look at the very top, the first part hitting the air, that is what it's doing is it's literally easing the air around here so that it's not a big flat surface that's hitting the air straight on. And that is crucial for actually allowing us to successfully get into space. There are a couple ways that we use drag, and I'm going to talk about landing on Mars. And so when we approach Mars, we're going about 13,000 miles an hour. So we are screaming. And we have to slow that spacecraft up from that speed all the way to zero. And so there are essentially three ways that we currently use drag to actually make that possible. First of all, when we come into the atmosphere, sometimes we can even go dipping into the atmosphere several times. And every time we pass through the atmosphere, it's amazing. It actually helps slow the spacecraft down. Finally, when we're ready to land, then the next thing we do is we, these, uh, typically we have like a capsule type uh, structure that is, has a bottom side, which is a shield. And this shield is designed to be burnt. And when it is coming down through the atmosphere and that ener the energy that's coming onto this thing will slow it down and is, it gets that speed completely under control. Um, that is not the only thing we use drag for though, because the next thing we do is when we get this thing slow enough, then we release these enormous chutes that are, uh, or parachutes that actually will help slow it down and gently drop it down on this, onto the surface. All of those things are, are using drag fundamentally to allow us to do something really cool like land on another planet. Kurt, should we take some questions? Sure. Let's start with the video question first. Hi, my name is Ella and I was wondering how many members are on a pit crew and what are their roles? Good question. The question is how many members are on a pit crew? And what we have is we've got seven members going over the wall, which there's a, there's a short wall on pit road. When the car comes in for service, seven guys go over the wall. There's a rear tire changer and a rear tire carrier. There's a front tire changer and a front tire carrier that change the front tires. There's a jack man to jack the car up. And there's a fuel man who, who puts gas in the car. The seventh member is for driver comfort. Normally we'll send him over the wall to pull what's called a tear off off the windshield. It's basically cleaning the windshield. We've got plastic wrap on the, on the windshield and there's a lot of tire and debris that comes off, off the racetrack gets on the windshield so we'll quickly pull a tear off off and all that can be done in less than 12 seconds. Now you talk about uh, you've got seven men that jump over the wall. Mm -hmm. What's the wall there for? The wall there is to separate the race car from the, tr from the teams. It's a safety device so that if, if a car comes spinning uh, it hits the wall and it doesn't get into the guys. Okay. So it's really there to protect the people behind the wall. Let's take an online question. Why not use a design similar to F1 cars? Their sleek design would cut down, would their sleek design cut down on wind, wind resistance? That's a, that's a great question. If you follow Formula One, you can see that a huge difference between Formula One cars and what we call stock cars, which are these over here. Formula One cars have open wheels, which while these aren't Formula One cars, you can see they look like that. Their wheels are not covered. And by the way, they actually have got more drag really? than our cars do. Yeah, significantly more drag. They've got more horsepower, but more drag. They also produce a lot more downforce. You see there's wings in the front of those cars and wings in the back. We have a spoiler and what's called a valence. The reason these cars look that way is because this racing was based off of production cars, the cars that your mother and father would drive years ago. And so the manufacturers and NASCAR wanted to maintain the, the jump between a production car and a race car. Okay. So the rules for Formula One cars are wide open in, in shapes, but the rules for stock cars 
want to maintain the connection between a production car and a race car. So do the same people who build my car that I drive to work, do they build the, the NASCAR cars as well? Um, the original manufacturer, and for instance at Roush Fenway, we, ra we race a Ford Fusion. We get a lot of parts and a lot of support from the manufacturer. Do they build the cars? They build a lot of the stampings, a lot of steel body parts they okay. build. But the rest of it has, has all migrated toward a, a racing type of an operation rather than production. Okay. Uh, who has my first audience question? Come on up. I was wondering how the build of a regular car is different from a race car. Well, there's actually quite a few things. If, if you think about the car that your mom and dad drive, you get in it and there's seats in the front and seats in the back. In a race car, there's one seat, right? It's just the driver. When you're driving down the road and you're warm, you can turn an air conditioner on, right? No air conditioners in race cars. You can roll a window down. You can't roll windows down in race cars. Everything on the inside of the car is taken out of it. It's very spartan. There's not very much in there to keep it light. We want to keep the cars very, very light, but we want to keep them strong. The, the, the structure of a race car is tube steel welded together. The structure of your mom and dad's car is stamped pieces of steel welded together, but the stamped, the, the stamped steel car has more room inside of it, right? You can keep your brothers and sisters in the back. There is no back seat in these cars. <laughs> so that's a little bit of the difference between production and, and race cars. Thank you. Great question. Let's take a video question. Hi, my name is Sarah. My question is, cars have tires that are filled with oxygen and nitrogen. Which one works better for NASCARs? Great question, Sarah. The question is, is do we run nitrogen and oxygen in, in, inside the tires? Do we blow the tires up with nitrogen and oxygen? The answer is no. We use primarily nitrogen. Nitrogen is an inert gas, which means that as it heats up, it doesn't expand very much. It expands a little, but not very much. And the reason why we like that is because the tire is a major portion of how the car handles. And the tire, based on its construction, has a spring rate to it. We change, on a pit stop, we'll change a quarter pound of air in the tires as an adjustment. It's a very, very minute adjustment, but it'll change how the car handles. If the driver says it's doing one thing, well, we try to, we try to correct that on a pit stop. So we use nitrogen in the tires to, to uh, make them go faster and make the setups be more consistent. Now we have talked about downforce and drag, mm -hmm. but there's one more D, yep. and that's drafting. Yes, and, sure and we talked to Jacob Wallace again about drafting. The best way to explain drafting is to think of um, air as molecules, and you have to move the molecules out of the way as a driver, and the car itself has to move the air molecules out of the way. And the way drafting helps this is um, by having two cars get in line. The first car is moving the air molecules out of the way. And then this, with the second car close behind, those air molecules can flow over the second car without having to bounce into the, the front bumper and get all stirred up again. The bump drafting is light drafting, but being as close as possible um, to the driver in front of you. And by close, I mean right on the bumper, and hence bump drafting. So the feeling of bump drafting, if you're the bumper, isn't that scary because um, you feel like you have more control um, because you're the one doing the bumping. It's much scarier if you're the one that's being bumped because you can see the car coming in your rearview mirror, but you're not 100% sure how much force they're going to hit you with, and you're not sure if it's going to be enough force to get your car unsettled. Well, we've got uh, Layton here, and she is putting on a race-worn suit that was worn by Kyle Busch, and this is really cool. Um, it's a fire suit. Why do they wear these? Well, this is in case of an accident. We carry 22 gallons of fuel in the race car, and a lot of times if there's accidents, uh, that fuel can go spilling and sloshing all over the place. There's, there's a small chance that, that a driver could be inside of a car with a fire inside of it. So these fire suits, uh, they're not fire, they're fire protection, they're not fire, uh, you, you can eventually get armed with them, but these are made of materials from SFI that have a resistance rating, whether it be 30 seconds or a minute, a driver can be inside of a fire, and because he's completely covered from head to toe, but between the helmet, the suit, the gloves, and the, and the footwear, he's safe for up to a minute inside of a burning car. 
That gives him opportunity, gives belts off, get the window net down, and get out of the car. Now there's a trade-off for that. Leighton, how's this feel? It's hot and heavy. <laughs> it is. It, it looks they, hot and heavy. They are hot and heavy. And what Leighton doesn't realize is that the drivers also have a, a set of undergarments, shirts and pants, that are underneath this and makes it even hotter. Inside of a race car, it can be 130, 140 degrees for up to four hours. So it's hot inside of there. But it's a trade-off. You need to keep them safe but you want them, you'd like to make them comfortable too. An engine like this behind us gets a little bit hot. Everything about the race cars are hot. And, yeah. and a suit like this actually has a strong connection to NASA, right? Uh, it does. In fact, this is a fire resistant suit and you'll find that the, that the astronauts wear something like this as protection from the same thing. They're sitting on top of a Roman candle and there's always a possibility of an accident. You want to give those astronauts enough time to get away from the spacecraft in case there is an accident. Awesome. Uh, Beth actually got a chance to wear a suit like this, and I am just a little bit jealous because she got to go on a NASCAR ride along. Check this out. Well, at Atlanta, they said I was hitting 208 down the back stretch. Oh, God. Lauren, <laughs> <Boy>, shut up. <laughs> Today I'm at the Richmond International Raceway with Warren Lipford, who's going to be my driver on this little adventure. Warren, thanks for being here. Oh, that's no problem. Okay, Warren, how fast are we actually going to go? Uh, we're probably top out, probably about 135, 140 today. Okay, and typically when you're racing, how fast do you go? Uh, they're probably hitting close to 160, probably, 170, okay. something like that. When you drive, I mean, it, you know, you just go on the corners, give it gas, and let off, and see what, you know, you feel G's, and just try not to wreck, and... Okay. And see how she goes. <laughs> All right, so I'm a little nervous about doing this, but let's get to it. All right, you ready? Ready as I'm gonna be. Richmond. That was awesome. Really awesome. <laughs> okay. Okay, so I've got to say this ride along was totally awesome. Warren, thank you so much. Kurt, should we take some more questions? Sure. Let's start with a video question. Hi, my name is Adam. My question is why don't any of the cars have any doors? Great question, Adam. The, the cars don't have doors. They started having doors, but NASCAR quickly made the guys weld those up and, sig and, and s subsequently we moved away from having doors as a safety item because uh, if you've ever seen these races, these cars tend to wreck a lot and there's a lot of times where, where if the doors were on the cars, they would fly open and present a safety issue. So NASCAR has mandated to the race teams that there, there will not, not be any doors on the race cars. And you might wonder how we get in and out of them. You just climb through the window. We have an online question. Is carbon fiber used in NASCAR? Uh, yes, actually carbon fiber, I, I'm not gonna say it's heavily used, but it's, it's used a lot. Uh, the seats, the carbon seats that uh, the drivers sit in are, are carbon. There are a lot of little things around the race car that are made of carbon. In today's world, the, uh, the hoods and the deck lids or the trunk lids are made of carbon. Carbon is, is finding its way into the sport. NASCAR has sort of kept it out of the sport for a long time because carbon is very expensive, but they're finding out that the weight savings can offset the monetary increase. Oh, okay. Uh, who's got my next audience question? Come on up. Would using a lighter material help the car go faster, but also make the car fl flip easy? Great question. And, and it, so it sort of speaks to the question beforehand that ask about carbon. carbon Fibers are, is, is a much lighter material, and we do use them 
One, to make the car lighter so it goes faster. And then you ask about would it help if it flips. A car that flips is a function of how it spins and how the air goes over the car when it spins. Carbon in particular won't necessarily change that. It, what, what you can do is you can make some of the parts of the car be carbon. You can exchange aluminum for carbon and some of those parts can be used to help stop the car from flipping. If you look at some of these cars over here, you'll see that along the top of them there are roof rails and those help the car from, that is spinning from flipping. And those pop up? There are roof flaps up here that pop up. The, the, the rails are stationary, but the flaps themselves do pop up and that, that's a major contributor to keeping cars on the ground. Okay. Great question. Good question. Let's take another video question. Hi, my name is Aiden and I was wondering, are they limited on their pit stops? Are, they, are we limited on our pit stops? We're not limited on how many times we come in for a pit stop, but we are limited on how many guys we can send over the wall, which I spoke to earlier saying there's seven guys. We're also limited on what we can do on a pit stop. L last year and in years past, we could do almost anything, uh, certainly not change a motor, but we could replace parts that were damaged on the car. This year, NASCAR's got some new rules that say, we don't want you it, we don't want you fixing your car on pit road because it poses a danger to the guys that are out there working. So we can no longer take parts over the wall and put new parts on the car. We can use what parts are left and reattach them, but we can't change out parts or add parts to the car. So yes, the answer to the question is there's a lot of limitations on what you can do on pit road. So duct tape must be a good friend. We use a lot of duct tape, yes. <laughs> well, that's all the time we have. Kurt, thank you so much for My being pleasure. with us. Uh, I'd also like to thank the NASCAR Hall of Fame, CRVA, our sponsor, the Gertrude E. Skelly Foundation. Um, and next month, we are going to take a look at women paving the way to Mars. Check this out. This is Sally Ride's T-38 helmet. She was America's first woman in space. She used to wear this when she flew on the NASA T-38 jets. One of the things you'll notice about Sally Ride's helmet is its color. Sally picked this color to match her personality. She also wanted to have a nicer script that had her name on the back. In June 1983, she flew on Challenger, bridging the gender gap in U.S. human spaceflight. Accomplished women have flown in space since then and more are preparing to follow in the future. If you think this is interesting, be sure to join us for STEM in 30. Today as we close out, we will leave you with more sights and sounds of my ride along. And be sure to stick around for a few minutes after the credits as we talk to Kurt a little bit more and take a few more of your questions. Thanks for Thanks watching. Thanks for watching. <laughs> Now, NASCAR drivers, there's a lot of safety that goes inside that car. And yes, there one is. of them is this funny looking thing. Do you want to tell mm -hmm. us what this is? Uh, this is a, a Hans device, and it's an acronym that stands for Head and Neck Restraint System. A uh, driver wears it around his neck, just like this. I hope I didn't hurt my microphone <laughs> there. Um, and what it does is, in case of a frontal accident, uh, if, without the head and neck restraint, the head tends to move tends to move forward and can damage the neck and actually kill you, okay? So with a head and neck restraint, you have a helmet that has tethers right here that are hooked to the head and neck restraint so that the head can't come forward. The, 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 the Hans device is worn like that, and then there are big straps, belt straps, that come over the top of this to keep it secure to the body. So this is, this is a safety system put in place after Dale Earnhardt senior was killed in, in 01. And uh, he died of, of a, a frontal impact and, and a lot of neck problems, a lot of, a lot of neck damage. So that is when uh, this system was formed and it is now part of, of the safety. 
of NASCAR. Thank you so much for explaining that mm -hmm. to us. Okay, who has my next question? Hi, my name is Miles, and I, my question is, what are the G-forces of a rocket launch compared to a regular NASCAR? What are the G-forces of a rocket launch compared to a NASCAR? Great question. Uh, G-forces <laughs> in NASCAR are more like in the 3, 4, or 5 range, depending on the racetrack. Uh, rocket ships can have two to three times that. Kind of the difference is, is that rocket ships or astronauts feel those G-forces at, at the time of launch. And so though, that sequence will take maybe 15, possibly 17 or 18 minutes. And so they, they feel more G-forces for a shorter period of time. The race car drivers are, are in those cars for up to four hours, oh. feeling that many G-forces for that long of a time. If you look inside of, a, of one of our race cars, you'll see that the helmet has a surround, a padded surround around it. And the G-forces on, on drivers are always trying to pull you to the right because we only turn left. And you'll see there's a lot of padding on the right-hand side. A driver, driver can actually rest his head up against some of that foam to help, help his neck you know, recover a little bit. So there's a, it's a great question. There's a lot of G-forces in both of them. One lasts for a little bit of time. One lasts for a long time. Who has the next question? Come on up. Come on up. <laughs> Hi, my name is Maurice. How, why do they use different seats in a NASCAR than a regular car? Why do they use different seats in a NASCAR than a regular Great car? Great question. And it all, it all comes back to safety, right? The different seats in a, in a NASCAR is all to protect the driver in case of an accident. The seats that you have in your, in your mom and dad's car are very comfortable, but are made for kids all the way up to big people, right? They have a large range that they have to cover. And the belt system that you have in those seats is basically a three-point belt, a lap belt and then a shoulder belt. The seats that NASCAR drivers have are, are made specifically for their shape and their size. So the, the, the driver, Tony Stewart's seat, is different than Danica Patrick's seat. And a lot of that is based on size. It's also based on safety. We, the drivers in NASCAR wear a six-point and some of them wear a seven-point harness system where if you have belts around here, belts around the hips, belts going to the seats, and, and all that's done because NASCAR cars go almost 200 miles an hour, whereas your mom and dad's car go 60 or 70 miles an hour. Who has my next question? Come on up. Hello, my name is Dawa. Uh, my question is, how many safety checks do you go through before a race to make sure the car is prepared? Great question. How many safety checks do we do? There's actually a lot of them. Our cars are, are built in our shops, and we will do a preliminary safety check on them before we load them on the truck to send, send them to the racetrack. And that's done by pretty much just nut and bolting a car, going around put a wrench on everything, every nut and every bolt. There's also safety checks checking there's an onboard fire system, so there's fire bottles in, involved in making sure that those are up to pressure. There's uh, checks of the fluid systems. Do we have the amount, right amount of oil? Do we have the right amount of fuel in the car? And do we have the right amount of coolant in the car? And then there's just visual checks. A lot of things, a lot of bad things happen when there's fluids that are dripping or coming out of the car. So uh, if, you let, let it, if you walk away from a car and come back 10 minutes later and there's fluid on the, on the ground, that's a bad thing. So those are some of the safety checks. At the racetrack, the cars are checked before they go out on the racetrack, whether it be practice or whether it be race. So there's as many as six different safety checks before the cars see the racetrack. We have time for one more question. Who has my very last question here? Hi, my name is Michael, and my question is, what program do you use to design the car? What programs do you use to design uh, race we, car? We use a number of different programs. Understand mm. that the car, the race car, can be divided up into a chassis portion and a body portion. The body portion is based on the manufacturer. In my case, it's a Ford Fusion. And so of the shape of that body comes basically from Ford. The under, underside of it, the chassis side of the structural side, we use CAD programs. We use uh, a lot of what's called FEA, finite element analysis program, which is a structural, we can structurally uh, model the car and then bend it like it bends on the racetrack. 
We also use uh, CFD, which is computational fluid dynamics, which is wind tunnel and a computer. All these programs are used when we go through the design phases. Great question. Thank you so much for being here again My today. Pleasure. And thank you for watching, and we'll see you next time on STEM and 30.